Well, thank you very much uh, come for the opportunity for me to come here and talk to you. Um, I think um, that we have evidence now to discriminate sacroiliac pain from common low back pain. That is uh, my belief. When I started the research uh, of the sacroiliac joint, it looked like this. The sacroiliac joint was like a white spot. Uh, the, the knowledge was really, really low. Uh, but uh, today we have some specific evidence-based tests and the treatment can be offered on knowledge-based technologies based on scientifically proven theories. Well, my name is Bengt Sturrosson and um, I'm working at the hospital in Engelholm, south part of Sweden. I started my research in Malmö Hospital, it is even more south, uh, the Lund University. And I'm very happy to have uh, two colleagues from the Lund University who was there when I started in uh, Malmö. But you, just to tell you that Lund and Malmö is two, 20 kilometers in between, but we have never very seldom corporations. And it's still the same situation, more or less. However, <coughs> I have also the opportunity to, to work together with Jöran Selvik, the inventor of RSA, radio stereometry, uh, and that was very important for me. And with this radio stereometry, you can measure small movements with accuracy around 0 .2, uh, 0 0.2 millimeters and 0 0.2 degrees. Our first question was, really to, to, to tell, are there any movements at all in the sacroiliac joints? Because that, that was a big debate in the 80s. Some people said no, no movements at all. Some people said they, 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 the, the joints doesn't exist, and so on. However, uh, in the end, it was like this. Uh, like Galileo, he was standing in front of the Pope and telling that the earth was flat. But never, however, he said, it is moving. And it was the same thing what we could say about the secular joint. The joint moves. However, it started for me 1985. I came to the University Hospital in Malmö and uh, I was asked, uh, what do you want to do in your research? And I said, secular joint. And um, everybody shake their head. I said, why? Why do you start this? Well, I'm, I was interested, I was extremely curious about the area be below L5. So um, I started to do a lot of uh, literature research and so on. Of course, it was not easy, but uh, very little was written. But I had all the patients. So my colleagues, they were very happy. So all patients with pain below L5, they were directed to me. So, so it's, it started to be a long row of uh, mainly women and I started to, to, to do some different things with them. And of course, we know that we need to have a proper diagnosis. If we don't have a proper di diagnosis, we can't make a proper treatment. And what I found a lot of um, different reliability studies, uh, and, and um, there was a lot about movement, movement tests, position tests, and so on at that time. Um, but we know today that uh, hands-on test has very poor reliability. So, so, so don't, don't do that. <laughs> well, we, we, I will continue to, to um, movements because uh, the case was movements. And RSA, the radio stereometric analysis, it looks like this. Um, you, you, um, you need to do double exposures, and then you have to define sacrum as a fixed segment, and the ilia is moving around sacrum. Um, the setup looks like this. You have two focus, you have the patient, and then you have two films. And then you have to put tantalum balls, both into the patient, and into the calibration cage. And from that, you can, with really good uh, advanced mathematics, uh, uh, tra uh, transform these 2Ds, 2D films, to a 3D system. And that, that takes an engineer and doctor 
to, to make this protocol, it was Jaron Selvig. I, to be honest, I don't understand the mathematics, and very few orthopedic surgeons need to understand that as well, because it's enough that the, the inventor understood it, and it's, it's really good, and it's used today in hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, articles in, in Europe. The first thing what you started to do is to, to check the movements, and uh, at that time, um, the standing hip flexion test was a uh, very important test uh, decided by Kirk Lee Willis. He was really promoting this test. And, um, and uh, I was also, I tried to examine the patient. I wasn't so good. And they said, you're not, not enough good to examine the patient. That was the case. So we, we did this um, examination with standing and standing with the left and the hip, uh, left and the right hip maximally flexed. At the same time, we made a reliability study, and we were not so happy with that because the reliability was extremely bad with this standing hip flexion test. And then the, we had the results. What, what we found, that we have almost no movement at all when doing this test. The movement was accord, uh, just close to the, to, to the uh, error of the method. So we could actually say, we can't use it. And then we go into the biomechanics of the secular joint. And um, I found out from, from um, I met Andrew Fleming and his studies, and he uh, looked at the form and force closure. And uh, you can look at the joint like the secular joint like a, a form. If you have a form that is very, how to say, uh, rectangular like this, um, then you will have no movement at all. The sacrum will stay there. This is called the form closure. And the form of the secular joint, is, it looks like this on, on the picture. It is very irregular. It is, it is really fixed form. And it, uh, it, uh, it is reducing the movement very much. The second thing is a force closure. And it's the muscle force that keeps uh, the sacrum close in between the ilia. And it's, uh, uh, with the, if you have very strong force, you can really keep sacrum into the ilia. But this is a reality. The reality is it's a, it's a mix of the form and the force closure. So actually, with this um, method, we prove the theory of the form and force closure. Because if you stand on one leg, you double. You double the load on, on the leg, one leg. You have to increase the muscle force to balance. If not, if you don't, if you don't increase the double force, you will fall into the floor. So actually, there can't be proven any movement when standing on one leg. So, so actually, we say this is an illusion. If you see movement when standing on a leg, it's an illusion. Uh, and what you see it is that the pelvis is rotating around the hip, mainly. And that, that is, you can, you can really um, provoke that. And um, the muscle force really compress the secular joint. So that was our first uh, understanding that the standing hip flexion test cannot be used in movement analysis. We studied, of course, movement in a lot of different ways as well. And, um, and uh, we studied um, uh, with a group of 25 patients in the beginning. And, and um, we measured supine to standing. And between supine to standing, there is a movement around 1.3 degrees in the secular joint. If you compare between supine and sitting, the movement is increased 25%, but it stopped to 1.5 degree. It's really small movement, and you can compare one degree with one millimeter in the secular joint. If you provoke um, hyperextension, then you can increase the movement. And there is, you can com come close to four millimeters between the position standing to prone with hyperextension. We didn't measure prone, because standing and prone has been proven before that it's the same position. So, so it's just to reduce the amount of radiation to the patients. So what we could find is that um, the movements are small, but they show a constant and almost normal distributed pattern like everything else in the body. 
the axis of, uh, of rotation, it's located with, can you see the cross, the X on this picture? That is the axis of rotation. And the movement is a sliding mo motion along the joint. I didn't prove that. It was proved previously by Selvik in, in a study together with Egund. Position test and movement test, it was nothing. But pain provocation test, it can be recommended. We know that. Uh, and and it, there was a very good uh, review uh, about pain provocation test uh, two years ago by Shadek and co-authors. And um, which, which test do I use in the clinic? Because I have a test protocol. And my first test is the P4 or the Oscor test. It's close to the five thrust test, but it's not that extensive. It is actually you put a gentle force with the hand on, on the knee in actual force. And you balance the pelvis with the other hand. You don't put the hand below with the thigh thrust. That is, it's too, too much with this patient because they're usually very sensitized. And if you, if you force too much on them, they can't walk afterwards. The second test that is evidence-based, it's a long ligament test. These patients, they have, they are extremely tender, just below the posterior or superior leg, leg spine. And this is also an evidence-based uh, test. The third test I use is the, it's called the Menel 2 test. And this was a test where I could show, show the biggest movement, I told you previously. And, and the, you can put the, end, uh, the joint into an end position, and you have to be very careful to think about the hip movements, first of all, and it, because if you have a hip problem, you can't use this test. Um, but if you have no hip problem, you can use it well. And you have to balance the sacrum with your hand, because if you don't do that, you will also test the lumbar spine. But it's it's easy test to do when, when, when you have a patient. And the, the last thing, the test I use is the active straight leg raise test. Also well documented. Patient with pain in the secular re uh, region, they can't lift the leg or they can hardly lift the leg. And then you can uh, compress the joint and they usually can lift it. It is like a miracle. Uh, so so um, that's good. This test, it is, it is um, um, many people use it, the Patrick Faber test. I don't use it. Uh, and um, the main reason, I think it's, it's a little too complicated test because there's a lot of things included. Uh, but it, it, it is, there are tests that say that it's a, it is a SI test. I have, my, I have my doubts, but it's my personal feeling. The Gensler test, it's a good test. It's also, uh, uh, we did some studies as well uh, on the reciprocal uh, straddle position, and it's, it's really so that you can provoke the movement backwards or forwards with the Gensler test. But it's a little more complicated to do. It takes more longer time, and if you have the patient, I usually don't do it, but so sometimes I do it. And, and this is quite a good test. Does this give enough evidence for treatment? And I, I say yes for physiotherapy. That's okay to use this test. And you can say that most likely this is a secular problem. Um, and um, however, there are not so many good physiotherapy uh, treatment to, to, to uh, give the patient. And um, if we look at um, the, uh, the literature, that recommendation here is individually tailed physical exercise program and cognitive behavioral treatment. It's the only one that is well documented and that this can't be given in so many places, actually. Um, what other options do we have? Manipulation and mobilizations, no evidence of that. Acupuncture, no ev evidence of that. Water gymnastics, no evidence. Physical exercise, low evidence with individual tailored program and the radio frequency denervation. We don't have it in Sweden uh, or in very few places, but the effect, it, is, it goes over. Um, this slide means for surgery, it's not enough with it, this diagnostic test. We need to confirm the diagnosis. It is very important. Um, my protocol uh, is I do the block one or two occasions, and um, it's very important that this block is done right. Um, this is um, the slides I have uh, received fr from the company, but this is, this is the way I do it. Inferior part of the joint is the only place where you can um, find the joint. 
I started to do this in the 80s, uh, and because at that time they said it is impossible. But uh, it was possible, and you need to use the dye to see, confirm that you are in, in the joint. And you also, you have to have a thin needle, so it, when you are in the no joint, the needle is not straight anymore. It is bowed. I, uh, and that, that I um, learned from Charles April and asked him, why do you have a, a, such a bow on your needles? It's so thin, he said. And that is a good thing. The alternative is uh, the CT, and, and uh, to use the CT is also, also very good, but it's more complicated than you need the help of the radiologist. We heard very, very good about the, the uh, innovation from, from Poly. It, it's a very complicated innovation, and it gives you a lot of problem, of course, because the, the innovation is so complicated from L4 to S2, and, and the, you have to be aware of that when you do your diagnostic procedures. So I think if you have a very clear-cut good block, then it's okay. If not, redo the injection, or do as I do, consider a test fixation. Um, when I started this um, um, research, I had to do something before I, I was allowed to do the secular fusions. Uh, so what, what we did, we fixed the patient with an external fixator. We measured them before the fixation uh, with this technique of RSA and with, after the fixation. And what, what did we find? Well, we find this patient. The day after the fixator, uh, we usually um, tight the, the, we tight the fixator as much as needed. And then the patient uh, feels, oh, now I have less pain or no pain. And they were happy. Uh, and and um, then they, they go home and wait at home for three weeks before the surgery. How can it work? It, is, it works like this. This is the figure. Uh, and you see uh, to the right, you can see the iliac wing. And that is where you put the, the screws. And the, with very little force, it's written F-O, uh, then, you can, then you can balance the counterforce with the ligaments, FL, and together then you, you compress the joint. You really reduce the movement in the joint. So he, here you can use the, the, what I uh, told you, the force closure. And, and the, the combination of the force closure and the form closure, it reduces the movement. So what happens when you put a frame on? it is that the, the movement is reduced to less than a half of the previous uh, pre-op uh, movement. And what happens is that sacrum rotates forward and it came to into a more stable position. Uh, and this is to prove the force closure. Uh, then we started to do some functional testing as well. It is the last year, so we checked the patient in walking, in leg transfer test, stairs, and active straight leg ra race test. So that, that instead of talking about instability, because at that time it was about the discussion was uh, instable joints, we changed to talk about stability. And, and uh, um, the, the case is you need to have a stable joint. So we, we actually we, uh, made a definition uh, after a lo lot of discussions, we, we came into the, this definition, the effective accommodation of the joints to each specific load demand through an adequately tailored joint compression as, f as a function of gravity, gravity, coordinated muscle and ligament forces to produce effective joint reaction forces under changing conditions. And this is a healthy individual. They have a they have stable situation. Here, we have the patients those with a non-optimal joint stability. After that, we could start to do the treatment pro protocols. And uh, uh, as, um, here I will show one patient. And you see the, her x-rays. Um, and and uh, she had the, the tests were positive. You could see her inability to walk and so on. And I operated on her uh, first on the right side and then on the left side two months later. And uh, well. 
The patient is happy and uh, I am happy. Thank you. <laughs>